Welcome, welcome. Unbound Visual Arts is very pleased that you have chosen to join us for this opening program for the exhibit, Teaching Children About Racial Justice. First of all, this event is being recorded. So if you prefer to stay hidden, just keep your video and audio off. For everyone else, please, please tell us where you're joining in from in the chat. And if you've been to the gallery to experience this amazing exhibit, which I think is one of UVA's best over its nine year history. Everyone present will be eligible for a pre raffle drawing at the end of the program as well. Um, Unbound Visual Arts is a unique nonprofit that creates impactful exhibits and programs to encourage learning, engagement and change. And this program and exhibit fits right in. This exhibit includes the artwork of 17 artists. And Natalie, can you show the slide with the artists? Yep. Oh, let's see. Let's see. Let's see. Let's see. Uh, all of the artists submitted artwork that examines the unique ways we can gain a more profound understanding of racial equity and foster meaningful conversation with children and families. We thank them all for their participation. Before we start the panel discussion, we want to show a one minute video tour of the, ex of the exhibit that Young On Lee, the curator created. And then one of the artists, Veronica, and Epitur will sing two of her original songs. So with that, I'm hoping that Natalie can fire up the video. Thank you, Natalie. So now we want to move right into uh, um, Veronica's songs. I've only heard one of them, so I, I'm hoping the second one is just as good. <laughs> Can you all hear me? So I will introduce this song. The name of the song is The Coconut Tree. And it's a song I wrote for children, some of my students. The coconut tree standing by the sea, listen to the birds telling their stories, describing places he had never seen, naming things by names he had never heard. The coconut tree wanted to have wings to go with his friends, the traveling birds, and explore the world around and around and bring back stories home to his island. 
His favorite dream was to see the snow and look and shelting all covered with flakes. He wanted to meet polar bears and wolves and say hi to seals and penguins and whales. One day he traded all his coconuts for some fun snowballs. He gave two children. They made a snowman, gave him a straw hat so he would never melt under the sun. The coconut tree now had a new friend with whom he could share fun stories and songs. La 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 la, la 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 la, la 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 la, la 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 la. If you'd like to sing with me, la 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 la. La 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 la, everybody. La 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 la. One more time. La 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 So this song is a song I have always sung a cappella. And I was really tempted to have a little music in the background. So the title of the song is My Name is Peace. My name is Peace. The black and the yellow The white and the red And even all the blues of the world you can find in my eyes the turquoise of love, the emerald of hope that were given to me. By my father, the sun, and my mother, the moon, harmony, justice, and freedom. And we walk hand in hand on the path of the world with a mission from love. My name is I'm the rainbow girl, and I am a message for you. Ooh, 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 ooh,
Thank you, Veronica. Thank you, John. Okay, I think we're ready for the panel discussion. And Natalie, can you take the slide? Stop sharing. Yeah. And okay, so there we, we anyone that has questions for the three artists or the curator can type them into the chat, or if you want to ask a question in person, just um, go to the reaction and raise your hand, uh, reactions. And so now, and so we actually had one sub, we're actually substituting one artist. Um, so Jen Turpin was gonna, is going to fill in for um, the artist, one of the other artists, I can't remember her name right now. Um, so I'm going, and then so Young Un Lee, the curator, will introduce the artists as they as they speak. That way, it'll be you'll remember something about them. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn my microphone on and turn it over to Kong. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, can you guys hear me? hear me? Yes. Good afternoon. It's really nice to meet you all today. Uh, my name is Kyung, and I am the curator of Teaching Children About Racial Justice. First of all, I wanted to thank all of the artists. I really, really enjoyed creating and designing exhibitions with your wonderful works. So thank you so much. So this exhibition could not have been completed without your support. And I am extending my thanks to the whole UVA team, Director John and exhibition assistants. Uh, I got my concept and idea from that I believe hate crime and racism often stem from a lack of education. And I also believe racial equity education is uh, one of the solutions in the fight for racial justice. So I wanted to uh, make the gallery space as an open learning space for the young viewer to discuss racial justice. Uh, so thank you so much for attending today and let's start the discussions. And my first question is, uh, can you describe a real life situation that inspired you? I'm just gonna type my first question to the chat. So. Varika, or do you have any like thoughts or can you answer? Yes. Um, well, um, my family is multiracial, multicultural, um, and also we have different spiritual orientations and we all are family from the same blood. Um, I have sons who are mixed African-American and we were once on the tea which is the, the train in Boston, going to school. And I was sitting with my son, but at some point he stood and went to sit right next to a man sitting in front of us who was a total stranger. And this man was also sitting with his son. And my son had his chin in his hand, thinking, thinking, thinking. Then he turned to the man and said, sir, may I ask you a question? And the man said, yes. What color are you? And the man, was a little surprised and said, I'm white. And then from that moment, everyone in the, in the train car was really paying close attention. So there was silence. My son went 
back to his reflection, then turned again to the man and said, sir, I have another question. And the guy said, sure. What color is your son? White. And at that point, everybody was really quiet thinking, oh my goodness. And my son went, hmm, I'm going to think about this. I'm going to have to think about this. So uh, I think one of the things is my sons grew without paying any attention to different colors. But one day they came from school and popped a question. They say, dad, what color are you? Mom, what color are you? And so they decided that their father was chocolate, their mother was vanilla, and they are oatmeal. And I assume that to them, it was a question mark. Why do they say white? Why do they say black? We are in all the different shades in between. So. This is a story that inspired me. Thank you for sharing. Thank you. Thank you. And Jan or Sarah, do you have any like, exp like experiences or? I can, can you hear me? <laughs> um, so the project that I, that was included in the exhibition is it's a group of maker projects for children and they're based on role models specifically women of color and it was inspired actually by my daughter going to kindergarten and this was the year that the covid started and she i, I had this deep feeling that it was not diverse the education was not diverse enough it just felt in my body i felt this like guttural feeling this is not diverse something is not right here so when covid actually happened i just i like felt compelled to launch into creating project after project after project to provide my daughters with role models stories about women of color because it felt it was missing. So for me, that's that was the impetus for this project. And I just kept making them. I just kept and they and my I have three daughters and um, each one like came to the projects in their own way. But still, we started from the story of this of women of color that were inspiring. So that's kind of how it started this project. Yeah. My inspiration for one of my pieces, um, I'm a teaching artist and am uh, teaching in Boston Public Schools. And similar to Sarah, like COVID came and things are changing. Um, and so we're figuring out the best way to support our young people during this time. And then um, the murder of George Floyd happened and all programming came to a stop and it became opportunities for students to process and to share their feelings and their anger. And um, a lot of students felt like they we had really real conversations and hard conversations over Zoom, which was brand new to us, um, but they spoke from the heart. And they talked about how they felt helpless and angry um, and talked about how we can be supportive to the Black Lives Matter movement, even if we're unable to join in rallies. And every year I work with primarily middle and high school students, but we do the artivism piece, so art activism. And we offered this as an option for the students who wanted to have their voices seen if they were unable to have their voices be heard. Um, and uh, so the students who chose to do an artivism piece were allowed to, and the students who opted not to were allowed to do things that were meaningful to them. Um, but one of the things that resonated in um, my conversations with one of my eighth grade groups was um, one of the black male students in my class said, you know, not for nothingness, what's the point in sharing my voice if it's not going to be heard um, and not going to be respected the same way that white students have uh, had their voices seen and respected in the school. And that stuck with me. So. Um, my artivism piece was for me to kind of meditate on his words and his thoughts and his feelings and his experiences. Great, thank you so much. And my next question is, uh, what are you trying to say through your work? 
Uh, we're just gonna type it on the chat room. Yes, Veronica. Thank you. Um, I had to write it down, so <laughs> because there's a lot of things. I'm trying to say that all people are people, that there is beauty in everyone. Respect to all life is the most fundamental value. Harm done in the name of a dogma or belief must be revisited. So we take steps towards healing and not repeating the mistakes of the past. Each life being has a contribution that must be acknowledged. And I'm also trying to say that there is more joy in sharing and learning from each other than there is in overpowering and destroying each other. I'm also trying to say that we all want the same simple things in life and we have one common language, which is laughter, and we should cultivate. These are the things I'm trying to say. Thank you. Thank you. And Sarah or Jan? Is it, is it okay if I share my screen just for this one? Okay, here, let me just... Um, Oh, wait. Um, oh, it's not letting me for some reason. I don't know. Okay. Um, what I, here I can try to just say it. For me, this project was um, two things. One, telling stories and one, making things. And I feel that it's so important for children to hear stories. Stories is they learn from stories, they create their sense of the world based on stories. And so with each of my projects, we, we read a book or we have a story about someone. And then the second part is making things because for children, hands-on making things, I mean, for us too, because we're all artists, but for children, it's, I've, it's incredible how much making things is important to them to connect to themselves, to connect to the world. Oh yeah, thank you. <laughs> I just, I put it there on that picture because that's the way it makes sense to me. But um, so for each of the projects, um, we have stories and we have making things. And then I hope that in the end we have role models that we can look to and we can feel empathy for, we can connect to, we can value difference and diversity, also see and feel commonalities. So that was the goal of this project for me. And as a, as a white person who is privileged in so many ways, I feel that I can't fully understand, but what I can do is be an ally and I can share stories of other people and I can be someone who brings these out. But I can't, I know, I know I can't fully understand. So, yeah. Thank you. I'm just gonna stop sharing. Thank you. <laughs> and Jan, do you have any like answer for this? I think um, the pieces, that are in the exhibit are trying to communicate enough already. Like injustice towards BIPOC folks have been going on in this country since before it even was a country. Um, and I chose two women who inspire me, um, Nina Simone and Dr. Maya Angelou, um, because they give me comfort and they give me hope. And I hope that their comfort and hope inspires others. Um, and I chose a quote from Maya Angelou that says, we should all know that diversity makes for a rich tapestry. And we must understand that all the threads of the tapestry are equal in value, no matter what their color. And that strength in coming together to, to build a strong and cohesive peace. Um, like, although it was a meditative process to create, like the symbolism of all of those, those threads coming together for one common cause was really 
um, at the root of both pieces. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. And uh, my next question is, what's your strongest memory of your, of your childhood, like related to the racial equity or racial justice? I just type it on the chat room. And Veronica or Sarah Jen. Veronica, do you have any like? <laughs> I have uh, to say, I'm, I'm so moved by this group. I am so moved by this group. I don't know how to say thank you for bringing us together. This is beautiful. Mm -hmm. um, my uh, childhood, um, the, the one thing that always comes to my mind when I think of my childhood is my best life friend. We have been friends since the age of two and we are sisters. She was born one week after me. And what brought us together, we were the two mixed girls in the classroom. Um, she's half Vietnamese and I'm half West Indian and that brought us close together. And what happened is that our families got very, very tightly in that friendship. So we all are a big family to this day. It's, just a story, but it has really transformed my life too. And she called me today for some reason. She called me today, and I told her I have this very important thing. I'm going to share our story. We used to say hi by rubbing noses. So I'm not sure what will happen the next time we see each other. When we have to wear big thick masks <laughs> to rub our noses. <laughs> yes. Sarah, do you have any like strongest memory of your childhood? Yeah, would you mind, sorry, sharing that? It's the beginning part of that file. <laughs> Thank you. Um, um, my, I can just talk about it first. Um, I was fortunate to have, I, I was, I'm from Illinois and I grew up in Champaign, Illinois. And yeah, that first one. Um, and this is my kindergarten teacher and her name is Mrs. Sessions. And she was incredible in so many ways. She was a gem of a teacher. She engaged every student at every level. Art was just infused into her classroom. I still, of all the classrooms in my life, I still remember hers. <laughs> and that was one of my first artworks. And I'm, I feel so fortunate to have had her as my role model for not because she was, I mean, because she was an amazing teacher and because of all that, but also because she looks different from me and she's a different race and she's from a different place and we're so different, but that's what I think is important for people like me to have role models that are so different from me. And I think that's important for everybody to have role models that um, come from different backgrounds, come from different experiences and then for you to learn about their differences, value their differences, and also find commonalities. So for me, I'm, I'm really fortunate. So that's Mrs. Sessions. <laughs> Love your first uh, painting. Uh, that was my first artwork, yeah, in her class. But I mean, that was kindergarten, so you can see she, yeah. I mean, yeah. And actually people from our town like hoped that they could get into her class. And actually some people I still know before she passed away, which was actually this year, would even go and visit her in the nursing home. That's how impactful she, she impacted people's lives for their whole life, basically. So she was, she did so many other things beyond teaching, but for children, she was that. <laughs> Great, thank you so much for sharing your childhood memory. And Jen, do you have any like, memory or do you have any like answer for these questions? Yeah, I had uh, a similar memory. Maybe it's not the strongest, but it's probably the first uh, when talking about um, memory of race in childhood, uh, similar to Veronica's uh, children and being in kindergarten and the teacher asking like, you know, what color are people? And people are coming up with, you know, their peaches and their creams and their their chocolates and all of these other things. And like the teacher was trying to help guide us like to other colors of skin tones. And 
it was just like so over our heads and like we're of course yelling out like greens and purples and just like not understanding um when we started hearing like black and brown were skin colors and it's just like i've not seen you know it's like that exposure um but that sitting on on the carpet in kindergarten and having that kind of guided discovery opportunity um and still being so confused about these like siloed categories thank you and my next question is how do you work comments on a social justice or racial justice? I type the question to the chat room and Veronique, do you have any answer to this question? Yes. Um, so I advocate passionately for certain groups, starting with children. I feel like they deserve to be protected but also grow without being inflicted limitations in who they want to bring into their circles as long as they are safe. Um, also, um, I advocate for indigenous people all around the world. I feel like they have been disrespected and mistreated to an extreme point. And I also believe they are the ones who hold the keys. They are the keepers of the keys of the future for this planet. And the third, um, group I could say that I advocate for is are the natural elements. Um, to me, they are live entities and we easily take them for granted. We could not survive if we didn't have fresh air, if we didn't have clean water. I feel like we came a long way thanks to fire and the earth is nourishing us. Um, so we really need to honor uh, and show gratitude to mother nature. And I have written poems and songs and painted or drawn about these things. Thank you. Thank you. And Sarah, do you have any answer? Yeah, sure. I think, I guess from my perspective, I think it's, I'm interested in the stories that we tell and the images that we see. And those need to be diverse. And um, I, I guess storybooks and history books and the art we see, it all needs to be equitable, inclusive, and diverse. I guess that's what I would say. <laughs> and I think artists are in a really good position because that's what we do, <laughs> right? So <laughs> we can be the forward thinkers. <laughs> and Jan? Um, for me, it's mostly about uplifting the voice of the young people. It's like they've got so much lived experience already and so many incredible ideas and their voices often aren't heard or respected. Um, and they should be. It's like they are going to be guiding our future um, for well past our time on earth. Um, and like the 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 Dr. Angelou piece that I did was intended to be brought to protests and rallies. Like it was something soft, something safe. It was double sided. It had a message that was uplifting and um, hopefully uh, had some deeper meaning for folks. But it was also something that could give comfort and like actually be physically wrapped around somebody if they were in a moment of need. Um, so yeah. Thank you for sharing. Thank you. And the next question is uh, the next question is gonna be the last question, but it's not. I think it's not for everyone because I'm gonna answer. I'm gonna give the question like how's children's education related to social justice different from country to country? So anyone who grew up in other country or who are located in other country, like can you guys answer for these questions? I'm just gonna type it, uh, the question to the chat room. Yes. Veronica, do you have any like? So um, the way that I answer this question is actually not by um, identifying a particular country. Uh, what I believe is that there 
the um, children who were born in countries that are at war and children who were born in countries that are at peace um, have a different uh, perspective of the world. Uh, those who were born in countries that are at war, they are taught to be hated and to hate. Um, in countries where there's peace, there can be what I consider cold war, based where even a nation People separate people into groups and then treat those groups differently with the notion that one group is superior to the other. And I think that is a terrible way of education for our children. And I think many places in the world uh, have a long way to go in, in that instance. So this is how I look at this question. Thank you. Thank you. And anyone who grew up in other country or do you guys have any like uh, answer for these questions? Um, not specific country to country, but just some, you know, kind of food for thought, even in the United States, like state to state and district to district, um, looking at all of the media about people fighting against critical race theory being taught in schools or having books banned or having books edited. It's really changing like the education of our students. And then maybe they're going off to a new state and learning new things. Um, but uh, social justice is not allowed in so many of our school districts. Mm -hmm. And Sarah, do you have any answer? If you don't have it, just, yeah, let me know. Yeah. No, okay. Uh, I grew up in Korea and I went to university in United States. So uh, my country, when back in my high school or like middle school, I think we don't have any like race other than like uh, Asian. So I think I didn't learn about racial justice or like social equity or like things, but I really enjoyed learning racial equity in the United States, like in my uh, uh, university. So yeah, I really, enjoyed learning it. So that's why I try to make these exhibitions as a curator. So thank you so much for attending this uh, exhibitions and these uh, discussions. And thank you so much for sharing your thoughts. Yeah, thank you. I think, yeah, I'm done with uh, my question to, your, uh, to you guys. Thank you very much, Gong and the, the three artists. I mean, I think everyone would agree that they was a fabulous presentation, and I'm so glad that we're that we're recording this session, so we can so we can share it with other people. Um, so, if there's any, we have we do have a few minutes for questions, and since this is a small group, um, you can just unmute yourself and ask the question, or either you can direct it to all all the panelists or just to a specific one. Um, if there are, so who's gonna be the brave one to ask the question? First question. <laughs> Do any of the panelists have questions for each other? Or for the curator? Um, Can you yeah, hear I, me? I, I'm glad. Oh, go ahead. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, I thought. Um, I was wondering uh, if uh, the this exhibition will be continued and uh, uh, brought to different schools in the uh, Boston area because you know I think uh, it is a very um, encouraging way and a very effective way of educating children and uh, sometimes the problem is you know the audience needs uh, uh, I mean help in uh, being exposed to this uh, kind of exhibition so I was wondering if there's a pro if there's a plan to bring the exhibit uh, to public schools especially in the Boston area so I guess that's a question for me. Mm -hmm. 
And um, I would say yes. I mean, there's not a plan. There's not a plan yet, but there's certainly an interest in doing that. Um, the the president of Unbound Visual Arts, the board of directors, is is a um, Ruth Riefenau is a is a longtime high school teacher, and um, I just I don't know if I just learned, but Jen is also a teacher, and um, so we may tap into our teacher pool and see what their thoughts are in terms of how we can how we can integrate into the into the curricula. Um, I think there I had some ideas, but my ideas are without a lot of knowledge on the school systems. Um, so I think we'll probably maybe we'll convene a little a little session to brainstorm in terms of how it can be done. Thank you. And Merlo, you have a question. Do you want to ask it directly? You want to type or you want to type it into the chat? Uh, I'll ask it directly. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, uh, we can is, hear you. Oh, okay. This is for I hope I pronounced him correct correctly. This is for Yang Ung Lee. Was that right? Yang. Yes. Yang? Yeah. Okay. Uh, my question is for like the good for your curation, like how did you categorize certain pieces together? Like what's the thought process behind that? Like how did you decide like what piece fit, fit well with another piece? I try to like play around first and then like uh uh maybe like I just play around first and then like I like my first draft was very different from this uh, current exhibition. So there's no category, but like I try to make it, I don't know, just maybe like color. Yeah, like if there's a black color and then I put like gray or like beige color next to the black one or I try to like uh, put together with the same artist. So like if one artist have three arts, then I put together or some of them, like they are is separately, but like I try to make it like on the same spot. Okay, thank you. So there's multiple answers to that question, Merlo. Okay, okay. Thank you, Young. Yeah. Are there other questions? Or even comments. It doesn't have to be a question. It can be a comment because we have we've got six more minutes. But we can close early if but this has been such a delightful session. I um I think I'd love to John do do jump in if I may, John. Brenda McSweeney oh. here. Hi, everybody. I'm also a founder of Umbam Visual Arts and on the Council of Advisors. Congratulations on this program. I just loved it. Young and everyone who worked with you and the artists, fantastic. A couple of things. First, your question on race and, and countries. I spent a lot of time in West Africa with the United Nations in Burkina Faso. At that time, it was called Upper Volta, Low Volta. And while race wouldn't have been the issue, often ethnicity was. And it was very painful sometimes seeing the inter-ethnic rivalries and the inter-ethnic subordination of certain groups. And sometimes it would be simply pleasantries, joking around saying, oh, but you're just a blacksmith if you were from the Forgeron community in one part of the country but the blacksmithing community, which was considered lower. But other times it was not just joking at all. I recalled from my early days in the office in Ouagadougou in Burkina Faso, one of my assistants had married in Paris to a fellow of a different ethnic group. And in Paris, it didn't seem to matter. But when they got home, it was the community around him that would push on him to 
her husband to put her down because she was from a group, the Tuare group, the cattle tending peoples that were considered lower. So I was just wondering if others of you had encountered inter-ethnic rivalries in addition to the racial rivalries, which might not have seemed so prominent. And yet on the whole, if I think back on my experience in Burkina, I adored the country. I'm, I'm still very much in touch now and have some of my best friends there. And the family life was so strong and pleasant and wonderful that it was irreplaceable for me and incomparable to what I see here. A second thought on the sharing of this program, which I think is fabulous, and I would love to see it shared more also. I'm thinking of the library networks and the BPL in particular, and some of our branches. Anne Langone, who is the librarian, children's librarian at the Faneuil branch, which is now under renovation, but everyone is still very much in touch. And she happens to be running the teachers union, I guess, the uh, BPL union, I guess you would say. And she's very much into these issues of diversity and inclusion and equity and equality. And I'd love for her to know about this program and see if she or others of the librarian team would have a way of sharing this. So congratulations to our marvelous curator, Jung, and the artists and all of you who assisted her and UVA, John and team who put this together. So bravo, brava, I should say. It's mostly women artists I'm seeing, but bravo and brava to all of you. Thank you. Do we still have time? Yes. Um, can I speak uh, something about what Brenda has just said? Um, I grew up in the Philippines, which uh, has a very long history of colonization by the Spaniards uh, for more than 300 years and 50 years of American colonization. And what I experienced was that colonization itself can uh, breed a kind of uh, uh, racial or color, uh, you know, discrimination, because we have been uh, uh, taught, I mean, made to believe that we are inferior and our color is not as good as, you know, the fair uh, skinned uh, colonizers or the mestizos or the hybrids. So I grew up in a, uh, in a uh, environment where, you know, the white, the fair uh, skinned uh, uh, Filipinos were regarded as higher in status and, you know, and more beautiful than the brown or the darker skinned Filipinos. So colonization has a very uh, important impact on how uh, race is uh, um, viewed by people and how it can, you know, uh, denigrate one's uh, racial uh, uh, identity. And so yes. that became a problem with Filipinos, you know, even among themselves, not only in America where, you know, racial divide is uh, more distinct in terms of uh, racial groups. I just wanted to add that. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, um, with that, I think we're going to close out the the um, the event and uh, thank everybody I think, for participating. And I think this was a fabulous program, and I really appreciate everyone's participation. And so, like I said, this is being recorded and I'm gonna turn the recording off.